Hey everyone, Steve from Backcountry Gallery here, and this time I'm going to share five ways to get more out of subject detection in your mirrorless camera. These tips will apply to most, if not all, mirrorless cameras that use subject detection or face slash eye detection. By the way, to keep it simple, we'll refer to all of these various face eye subject detection systems as simply subject detection throughout this video. Note that although there are minor differences in subject detection between manufacturers, these tips are fairly universal and can help you enjoy better results regardless of the brand name stamped across the front of your mirrorless camera. Also, if you enjoy videos like this and find the content useful, please like and subscribe. It helps boost the video and helps keep the channel going. Thanks in advance. Before we get into the tips, let's first define what subject detection actually is. Subject detection is a refinement of your AF area, typically targeting the subject itself, the subject's face, or better yet, the subject's eyes. People tend to think that if they point an AF area at a subject and it focuses, then it must be using subject detection, but that's not necessarily the case. If you point your camera at a target and subject detection kicks in, you'll typically see the normal AF area refined to a smaller single AF area targeting the subject itself, its face, or its eye. For example, with a predefined AF area like the Nikon wide AF areas or the Sony spot AF areas, you'll see the main AF area in the viewfinder and then when subject detection finds a target, you'll see a smaller box pop up further refining the focus area. In Nikon Auto AF or Sony Wide AF, you'll typically see a series of boxes when the AF system is not using subject detection, and these will turn into a single box of varying size when subject detection kicks in. Also, as a side note, the main reason I like to use subject detection is that it allows compositional freedom. Once I'm on my subject, subject detection will stick to it within the restrictions of the current AF area. One of my favorite ways to use subject detection is with 3D AF in Nikon or tracking mode in Sony, so once it's locked on, the subject can go anywhere in the viewfinder and the camera will stick with it. Now the tips. Number one, use recognizable subjects. This one is easy, but I see people make this mistake all the time. In order for subject detection to be effective, you have to feed it a subject it recognizes. If you don't, the AF area will typically act as it normally does and you may not get the result you expect. For instance, elephants have proved impossible for every subject detection system I've used. So if I point my auto or wide AF area in the direction of an elephant and expect the camera to latch onto the eye, I'm setting myself up for disappointment and likely a shot focused at exactly the wrong spot. In that case, I'm better off taking a more traditional approach and using something like single point or spot AF and keeping subject detection on the bench. On the other hand, if I point my camera towards a lion with subject detection on, there's an exceptionally high probability it'll get right on the eye with little difficulty since most subject detection systems are great at recognizing cats of any size. The same often applies to birds since most modern subject detection systems are fairly good at finding the eyes of our avian friends. Of course, there's an in-between area here too where subject detection will sporadically lock onto an eye. For example, I find both my Nikon Z9 and Sony A1 have an on-again, off-again relationship with the eyes and faces of primates. When I find that subject detection is uncertain, I usually turn it off and I take matters into my own hands with single point AF. The last thing I want is subject detection wandering off course at the moment something amazing happens. There are also times subject detection will be on the eye one second and then on an ear or a nostril the next. Heck, in some cases, like with a hippo, it seems to prefer the ear to the eye, and I found this happens with both my A1 and my C9. Sometimes you can remedy this by using a smaller subject detection supported AF area to help keep the camera's attention kind of where you want it on the animal, but sometimes going to a single AF point is really the best choice. Finally, if subject detection doesn't have a good view of the face or the eye, it's going to struggle. Often our subject turns its head or maybe the head becomes partially obscured by vegetation and we find subject detection kind of lets it go. Once again, in order for subject detection to be effective, it has to recognize the target. In this case, however, once the animal is in the clear or facing more towards the camera, subject detection will happily grab back on. 
The bad news is that it does take a little bit of trial and error to learn what works well, what works sporadically, or what doesn't work at all with a particular camera. But once you do have a good idea of what works and what doesn't, it's then up to you as the photographer to know when to take advantage of subject detection and when to shut it off and take matters into your own hands. The mistake I see over and over is when people start to rely completely on subject detection and they won't take over as needed. It costs you a lot of shots. Number two, subject speed and subject detection. Subject detection tends to work better when your subject stays in the same place in the frame. In fact, you've likely noticed that subject detection tends to find eyes far faster and more reliably when you have a stationary subject versus when your target is in motion. However, it's more than just the speed of the subject. It's also about how well you keep the subject in place in the viewfinder. The better you are at keeping your subject in the same position in the frame as it runs or flies, the more reliably subject detection will be able to stick with the face or the eye. On the other hand, if the target's all over the viewfinder, subject detection will often struggle to keep up. And you know what? It may give up altogether, reverting back to the normal AF area, depending on how your camera works. In addition, the more obstacles that get in the way of the face or the eye, the tougher it is for the system to stick with the target. For example, if you're tracking a bird from the side and the wing blocks the face or the eye, it's going to tax the system a little bit more than if the bird is coming at you at like a 45 degree angle. The same applies if there are obstacles in the terrain between you and your moving target. Basically, the better and longer the system can see the subject's face and eye, and the more they stay in roughly the same place in the viewfinder, the better subject detection is going to stick to it. All of this isn't to say you shouldn't use subject detection with moving targets. Heck, most of the time it's better than I am at keeping an AF area on the face or the eye. The point here is to know its limits, what can affect it, and that the quality of your panning technique can have a noticeable impact on how well subject detection stays where you want it. Number three, distance makes a difference. One complaint I hear about subject detection is that with distance subjects, it doesn't seem to get on the face or the eye very well. The thing is, this goes back to our first point. The camera has to recognize the subject. In this case, if the target is too far away, there just isn't enough detail for the camera to recognize the face or the eye. However, even if subject detection doesn't engage, as long as the camera is still focused somewhere on that distant subject using a normal AF area, depth of field is usually enough to ensure a sharp eyeball. In addition, intermittent engagement with the face or the eye is often a result of being a little too far away. I find that the better I am at filling the frame, the better the camera does at finding the face or the eye of my subject. As a side note, you can often force the issue if you can quickly change from full frame to DX or APS-C crop mode in some cameras. For example, I find that my Nikon Z9 is sometimes better at identifying the eye of a distant, difficult target when it's in DX crop mode, as shown here with one of our cats. On the other hand, switching to an APS-C crop doesn't seem to make any difference with my Sony A1. Still, depending on your brand and specific camera, crop mode may be worth a try the next time subject detection is struggling with a distant target. Number four, pre-focus. Another tip that's universal between all the subject detection systems I've seen is that the subject has to be in at least reasonable focus for subject detection to find it. The thing is, when the camera doesn't see a target it recognizes, it typically uses whatever AF area you're currently in as it normally would if subject detection didn't exist. This means if you're using a larger AF area or one that spans the entire viewfinder like auto in Nikon or Canon or wide in Sony, there's a chance the camera may lock onto something else in the frame as it focuses and tries to hunt for a juicy target. Now if, as it's focusing, your subject comes into focus, it'll likely lock right on. However, if it locks onto the foreground first and your subject is completely out of focus behind it, there's zero chance it'll lock on without intervention even with a target the camera subject detection system would normally recognize with ease. My solution to this is to always have my focus distance at about the same range as my subject. Sometimes this means manually focusing the lens to get it close. Sometimes that means focusing on something near the target or near where I expect the target to be. Again, it's also totally possible the camera would have stumbled onto your intended target by itself, but why take a chance? Getting focus distance at roughly the same range as your critter is one of the surest ways I know to coax it into grabbing on without any drama. This is also a handy technique when you're dealing with a larger AF area and have multiple recognizable targets at different distances in the frame. Often by pre-focusing on the one you want, you can guide the camera to lock onto that specific target. 
Number five, proper exposure helps. Having a proper exposure for our subject also seems to help. If the image is really dark or really bright, subject detection can struggle to locate things like faces or eyes. This is particularly true if the subject is backlit. Now take a look at how the Nikon Z7 II gets progressively better at locating the face and the eye of this cat as I increase the brightness of the exposure. Also, note that on higher end cameras, subject detection doesn't seem as reliant on a proper exposure to find her face or an eye. With my Z9 and A1, subject detection will often spot an eye even when the viewfinder is nearly black. However, just finding the eye often isn't enough. I find that subject detection tends to be stickier when I have a proper brightness level for my subject. In addition, and anecdotally, I also find that when I have a proper brightness level for my target, that subject detection tends to be more accurate and consistent than when my subject is really underexposed. One last piece of advice. That's about it, but I'll leave you with this one last piece of advice. The biggest key to a high keeper rate while using a camera with subject detection is knowing when to use it and when to shut it off. As a guideline, if I find subject detection is either not working, is locking onto the wrong areas, or is erratic, I just shut it off. The only time I use subject detection is when it's consistently and reliably sticking to the area I want. For action, I use it as long as it's doing a better job than I could by tracking the target with a normal AF area. Otherwise, I shut it off. Overall, I found subject detection incredibly helpful in my wildlife work, and I do use it for well over 50% of my work. However, I couple it with the advice in this video and generally get very good results. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you stop by the site and check out all my educational materials. I have books and video workshops that are just loaded with tips and advice just like this that are field tested and proven to give you a higher keeper rate. Go ahead, check them out. I know you're going to love them. Also, be sure you stop by the site and sign up for my free email newsletter so you never miss one of these videos, one of my articles or workshops or any of the other cool stuff that I do. And as always, I sure appreciate it if you would like, subscribe, and get notified. As always, thanks for watching. Have a great day.